Peter Platzer, the CEO of NanoSatisfy, is going to talk about something that he really hasn't talked about much anywhere before. Um, nanosatellites, or CubeSats as they're called, taking some of this whole sensing capability into a whole new place, outer space. So Peter, please, take it away. Thanks, David. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the high ground space. You know, we talked a lot about uh, sensors on Earth, but let's put it to the high ground, as the military would call it. And for that, I'd, I'd like to take you on a little journey. And I ask you to close your eyes and picture a satellite. Ask yourself, how big is it? What does it cost? How long did it uh, take to build it? Um, and then maybe ask yourself, um, how many do we launch per year? Um, who has access to them and can use them? And then what kind of technology do we use on them? Now, if you're anywhere like you know, most people, which I know you're not, but um, maybe still what you saw was something like this, maybe in higher resolution. Right? And uh, what it is is it's a satellite that is very large, you know, like a car or a bus. Um, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, maybe even billions. It took many years to build, um, sometimes decades. Um, when you think about how many there are, you know, actually very few. People are even surprised when we say that there are um, 100 uh, that, they, that we launch every single year. Um, people who get access to it is military, government, you know, for TV, we, we use it a little bit. And the one thing that you might have gotten wrong is what kind of technology it uses. Because some of you might have thought that space is actually cutting edge technology. And the truth is that this is like the most modern uh, weather satellite that the United States uh, government is flying. And it's basically equivalent to like a Pentium 2 running Windows 98. Anyone running Windows 98? OK. Um, what I'm here to tell you is that that actually is not true. What I would have wanted you to think about of a satellite is this. This is a satellite. So what you see up there is actually sitting in our office right now. Uh, we have our first ones. Um, and how big is it? Like this. If it grows up, it's as big as a bottle of wine. It costs a few hundred thousand dollars. There are like three satellites that are currently being built and to be launched through Kickstarter campaigns. Ours are going up in August 5th. Um, how long does it take? Um, a few months. I feel we are slow. We finished our Kickstarter campaign in the end of the summer, and we now have two satellites. The next one are going to be much faster. It's going to be a few weeks. Um, how many do we want to launch? Hundreds. And I mean literally hundreds. Um, who gets to access and to use them? Everyone. You want to control a satellite? You go onto my web page. You sign up. You can control the satellite. Right? Companies, individual, governments, military. Everyone is using them. Military has great programs for those CubeSats. Um, and the one thing that you would have gotten right again is that this actually is cutting edge technology. This is like an iPhone 5. It's using literally the most modern things that are out there. And I think what he said is like we saw this in the, in, in the former panel is that if I had asked you 20 years ago, picture a satellite, you have come up with the same answer. And I think Dave said like really, you know, well in a panel beforehand of what has done, what has happened on Earth is that if I'd asked you 20 years ago to picture a computer, you would have pictured this. This is like the, uh, the cray that we used when I was at CERN. Um, and it would ask you, you know, what are the features? You would say, it's, you know, it's uh, very costly. Um, this is not going, OK. Um, it's very large. It costs a lot of money. Military government uses it. But if I ask you today to close your eyes and picture a computer, you probably would have pictured an iPad or an iPhone. Because it just costs like a few hundred dollars. Everyone can use it. It's hundreds of millions of those devices are out there. And the very same thing is happening in space. There is like a, uh, a few key technologies that are happening there um, that do similar things as we did with computers, where bringing down the price point five orders of magnitude has created an internet of global connectivity. Computation power is ubiquitously available to everyone 24-7. Um, and we actually get this kind of like upgrade cycle. This thing is not working as fast. So that there are like three enabling forces uh, that I would like to mention. 
why this is happening now in space, and they're very similar to what drove the whole thing on the, uh, on the computer side. Number one, uh, you have standards. Mainframe to PC suddenly there was a standard. Same thing, CubeSats and PPOT is a standard. There have been more satellite launched using that standard than anything else. There are more teams across the world working on this standard than on anything else with regards to satellites. The same thing is uh, Moore's Law. We have massive amounts of economies of scale happening on Earth that allows me to put better and better sensors literally every couple of months into my satellites. I upgraded my camera already three times. Um, and last but not least, there is um, uh, budget constraints. Stopping the shuttle program basically created SpaceX. And sequestration is further hampering NASA. And we just signed an agreement with NASA to help them with education and outreach, which basically, as of now, is blocked. NASA is not allowed to do any of that anymore. Now, what do you do? What can you get when you have this kind of like ubiquitous high ground uh, sensor data network? And what can you do when you actually combine that with sensors on Earth? And I don't have enough time to go into all the ideas, so I want to just give you like a couple of those things that can happen. So the first one, let's think of a problem that we haven't solved for like a few hundred thousand years, and that is um, earthquake uh, prediction, or just an early warning system. But if you have 24-7 real HD um, streaming from space, you can actually combine large-scale observation of animal behavior. You can do, in remote areas, uh, low-frequency radio um, uh, uh, connectivity that you can measure uh, those transmissions. And you can combine it with human behavior through our cell phones. How much do we move? How often do we call in sick? What is like our general you know, state? Are we, are, you know, how many people call in for sick? All of this we've started to pick up, but we're missing the high ground. With this one, we can do that. Another one is. Peter, quickly, the point being yep. that you believe that if you correlated all that data and, and observed it for a long enough period, you could begin to start predicting yes. when an earthquake happens. Yes, exactly. But only if you have the space element included. Exactly. You yeah. need the high ground, as the military calls it, yeah. to have like that overview. Keep going. Sorry. Yeah. So another one is, uh, is food supply, right? So there's something that's called precision agriculture, where if you have like the overview in remote areas to monitor large areas and have sensors that you have locally, but you can easily connect them together, you can actually have massive improvement in food supply. Right? Um, if you look at the US, the value add often uh, US uh, uh, agricultural worker is 100 times of an Indian. So combining that, and that has to do with position agriculture and access to data. But last but not least, let's think about entertainment. Let's be an astronaut. When I give you 3D hat mounted display, they're coming out. And then I give you real time streaming of a camera in space. You're sitting inside a satellite. So when you see this, you see it in 3D, and you can steer which way it goes. Wow. So is that it? Yeah. Oh, good. So uh, no, I'm, no if that is not enough, I have nothing else. Well, well it's pretty good. So, so just talk a little more about what some of the sensors are that may be up there in space. Obviously, cameras. Right? Yeah, so cameras but, is clearly one of them. But, but what would be some of the others? But you have uh, magnetic sensors, um, uh, proton and electron sensors. So. Solar storms are like actually a, you know, a hundreds of millions of dollars damage problem. Noah predicted that if a solar storm that we had in the late 19th century hit the US today, we have a trillion dollar damages on Earth in equipment. And if you don't have a sensor network which does magnetic fields, um, uh, electron and protons from the sun, you don't have enough early warning and you have this damage. Do we have that today up there now? No, we don't. We don't have it at all. So this, somebody could decide to use your product yeah. for that. You're not going to do it yourself, but someone might decide to buy, buy the data. Rent, rent capacity from yeah. you and put it in there. Yeah. Right. So, so the idea is that these are going to be accessible to be rented for any kind of app. Right? Yeah. That's the basic, basic concept. And we have released, we have released um, an SDK for our satellite so people can build applications based on the technology which is in space. And so just again, uh, just to reiterate, because I, I think it is really worth underscoring, that because the satellites themselves are getting so cheap, and you're going to have capabilities to launch large numbers of them at once in like one package that then disperses yep. out. You didn't actually tell us that, but you told me that before. Yep. Um, that, that Secret. You can keep the technology in space much more up to date yes. in the same way that it's up to date in our pockets 
but we have Windows 98 in space. And yes. it's a sort of fundamental sea change yes. in the nature of the technology we're going to have in space. And then combined with all these sensors on Earth, yeah. it just adds to the truly revolutionary quality of this Internet of Everything, right? Yeah. I mean, what you guys talked in the panel before, and of taking the sensors from an iPhone and putting it into a sugar cube, that is exactly happening. In July, I had a camera of like VGA standard. Three months later, I replaced it with four times the resolution. Four months later, I replaced it with four times the resolution. Six months later, eight times the resolution, I'm going to replace it. Because there is like, you know, 100 million iPhones built out there with cameras, magnetometers, gyros, accelerometers, and I just put them into the spacecraft. Well, thanks so much. One of the reasons we wanted to have Peter was it really underscores the everything piece of this case when you start thinking about the implications of the satellites entering into this ecosystem of sensing and, and data production and, and, and intelligence. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.